The F-18 EF Super Hornet is the US Navy jack of all trades. Raise your hand if you don't know the aircraft. Good, I see no hands up. Slightly less well known is the EA-18G Growler. This is the electronic variant of the F-18 Super Hornet. Many of you will have seen these Hornets with large pods with a cartoonish propeller on the nose. That is the AN-ALQ-99 electronic warfare system. Recently, pictures emerged of growlers carrying something unusual. And for once, we know what that is. Um, it is very interesting stuff. Usually the Growler flies with three AN ALQ-99 pods, two on the wing stations and one on the centerline pylon. This is a typical configuration which includes two harm anti-radiation missiles and two AMRAMs for self-defense. In this case though, the three pods are more important than the weapons. The three pods are jammers whose purpose is to degrade the opponent's radar and communications. The Growlers have flown with these pods since 2009, which is the year of their introduction. In 2023, though, we started seeing these quite nondescript pods in their place. They have been seen either alone or with a third ANLQ-99 on the center line. Well, there's no mystery. You are a terrible YouTuber, sir. Please don't give everything away in the first three minutes. Yeah, Otis, I know what you mean, but I can't help myself. These are AN ALQ249 pods, the first deliverables of the next generation Jammer program, NGJ for short. Serial deliveries started in 2024, and these are progressively replacing the AN ALQ99. What you're seeing here are actually the mid-band pods. There will be more in the future for different frequency bands, but before getting to these details, how did we get to this point and, crucially, why? NGJ procurement started in 2009 and it was rife with tribulations. The original project was configured as an ALQ99 replacement in two stages, later brought to three, called increment 1, increment 2, and, you guess it, increment 3. What we see today is the increment 1, designed by Raytheon, which received the contract in 2013. Yep, it took 10 years to develop, because the system is radically different from the legacy. It is not an evolution, it is a revolution. In the meanwhile, the increments were renamed NGJ Mid-Band, NGJ Low-Band, and NGJ High-Band and the current NGJ is the mid-band component. The low band is in development, while the high band is currently unfunded. We will get back to it. In the meanwhile, though, in 2020, Al3 got the contract for the low band component beating Northrop Grumman. Then Northrop Grumman filed eight protests with the General Accounting Office. The General Accounting Office agreed with two of them and asked the Navy to reevaluate the offers. Then L3 protested against the protest and the Navy stuck with the decision in favor of L3. So Northrop Grumman went to a federal court and in the meanwhile the Australians, who are increasingly becoming the best Uncle Sam's friends, decided to get on board and finance the part of the development. At the end, the Navy had to repeat the competition and L3, now L3 Harris, won the contract in September 2024. Obviously, the US Navy procurement is always subject to scrutiny, even because in the last few decades we had several not-so-successful programs like the Zumwalt, the LCS, and so on. However, the perspective used to present these issues to the public is not unbiased. It depends on the sources, their factuality, and their political bias. And this is when Ground News, which is sponsoring this video, becomes very, very useful. Ground News is a website and an app that gathers related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the world in one place, so you can compare how different outlets cover the same subject. Every story comes with a clear breakdown of the political bias, credibility, ownership, and then headlines of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. You can learn more by clicking my link, ground.news slash millennium, or scanning the QR code here. 
For example, take this story about a US Navy destroyer helping defend Israel from the Iranian missile attack that happened a few weeks ago. This has been covered by a decent number of sources, about 20, but here we see that the coverage is predominantly right-wing, and if we go down a little bit, we also see that the factuality of the sources covering it is not that great. And in fact, if you click on the right, we see some sources with a pretty plain coverage, nothing major here, but the strange thing is if you click on left, yeah, there's just one source with mixed factuality. And this is the reason why Ground News has a feature like the blind spot. With the blind spot, you can see the kind of stories that you won't be exposed to if you predominantly consume media from one side of the political spectrum. Ground news is very important for my research since I try to be as factual and unbiased as I can about something that often is neither black nor white. And now please go to ground.news millennium or scan my QR code. Ground News is giving my viewers 50% off their unlimited access vantage plan. This is their best deal of the year and it will only be available for a limited time. If you're already a subscriber, you can send Ground News as a gift for 50% off too. So make sure you use my link. I think Ground News is doing an important work and I hope you'll check them out. Please support the people who support me. Why did it happen in the first place? Why did the AN ALQ-99 needed to be replaced? Well, this pod is old, its design goes back to the late 60s and it was first introduced in 1972 on the EA-6B prowlers of the US Navy. Its baptism of fire was during the Vietnam War. Obviously, like all modern systems, and the electronic systems in particular, it went through several iterations and improvements. An interesting one, for example, was the E variant, where basically the same electronic was fitted into a nacelle under the fuselage of the F 111 to create the EF 111A Raven. Fun fact the blob on the tail of both the EA 6 and the EF 111 contains ESM stuff. It is a listening device, not a jamming device, and it is kept far away from the jammers to minimize interference and damage. Electronic warfare is always a closely guarded secret. What exactly the LQ-99 does, what techniques are used, it will go in the public domain in 50 years from now at the least. So add an appointment in your calendar for the year 2075 to remind you to check for the release. Done, sir. I will check and report back. Thank you, Otis. Anyway, the improvement did not go in the direction of increasing power, it actually decreased from 10.8 kW to 6.8 kW. What was improved though was the frequency coverage, which uh, the PUD started working in the typical surface-to-air and air surveillance radar band to increase toward the airborne radar band and decrease toward UHF and VHF bands. Actually, the Navy uses its own classification for this purpose, uh, that you can see on screen. Another improvement was the processing power and the automation. In the early variants, the Prowler crew had to identify the emitter, characterize the signal and work out the best jamming technique with the onboard instruments. On the latest variants, this process becomes more and more automated with the purpose of leaving to the humans only the decisions that really require human intervention. Which kind of decisions? Sir, are you saying that robots can't take sound decisions? Uh, well, Otis, these systems are not as good as you are. They really can't take decisions as sound as you would do. The variant currently in use with the Growler is the ICAP 3, introduced in 2003. Not too old, but still, there are problems. The main one is reliability. The inbuilt test system is prone to malfunction and the crew sometimes doesn't know if some component on the pod is not working as expected. This is so common that additional aircraft have to be assigned to a mission just for redundancy. 
Moreover, the directionality of the mission is not that great, and this generates three issues. The obvious one is that you don't want to disperse energy. The ideal jamming emission is a narrow beam centered on the emitter being jammed. But, flying in a formation of aircraft, the crew must consider the position of their own flight companions to avoid putting them in a lateral lob or in the beam and jamming them too. At that level of power and at short distance, it is possible to cause malfunctions and even health issues. And since the Growler mission is to protect the Super Hornets, it is reported that this constraint caused problems. That tactical and operational level. Third, the emission badly molds the Growler electronics. On the EA-6, when the jammers were active, it was impossible to communicate or listen to the opponent's emissions. The crew had to multiplex in time and frequency to maintain the situational awareness, thus opening windows in, in the jamming. The Growler listening system is the ANALQ-218, which is physically located on the wingtips. In this system has been integrated a technology called INCANS, which allows jamming cancellation for the onboard systems. It is very clever, but not 100% effective. For example, when jamming, the EA-18 can only communicate by voice. Even the APG-79 radar, which is very modern and versatile, suffers from interference when the ALQ-99 is actively jamming which is a problem because the APG-79 is an integral part of the Growler electronic suite. Like most of the modern AESA radars, it can be used as a passive sensor and as a jammer for self-protection, and you would like to be able to look around when jamming. So it is quite clear how the Navy needed something new, not only for the aging, but also to fix these problems and use the Growlers at the top of their possibilities. Now we know why this replacement was needed. But how did they replace the 99s? Or basically, what is inside the NGJ? The ANALQ249 weighs about 550 kilos. Technically, the Growler can carry up to five pods, but the normal configuration is what the industry calls a ship set, that is, two pods. Since the low band pod is still in development, the center line will be occupied by 99 for a while, still covering the low band. Carrying these pods limits the aircraft to subsonic speeds, but, well, this is true for most store combinations, uh, so it's not a big problem. Inside the pod you have four AESA arrays, two in the front and two on the back. These are mechanically steerable, a fact which, combined with the electronically steerable beam typical of AESA arrays, it should give a 360 degrees coverage, more or less. This is important because often the combat aircraft don't have rear-facing jammers. So, while a fighter could self-protect during the ingress, it can't during the egress. And since I suppose you don't want to steer the beam towards the aircraft fuselage anyway, so, well, that's why you need two. Each array should be able to emit multiple beams that tend to be narrower than other types of antennas, being also more energy efficient. The array emitting modules are based on gallium nitride components, which are themselves a progress being more energy efficient in generating the RF power. This means that each pod can suppress a certain number of threats. We don't know how many. It could be anything between 2 and, I guess, 20-something, but definitely not in the hundreds. The central part of the pod is occupied by the power generation. It is a ram air turbine in flight to intakes and to outlets open on the side of the pod to canalize the flow through the turbine. And considering the size, it looks more powerful than the old 99. And we are told so, uh, but we don't know how many electrical kilowatts are actually available. The pod can receive electrical power from the aircraft for test, uh, control and ground operations, but that power is not used for jamming. Fighter aircraft already tend to be quite short of electrical power, so that's the reason why you need a separate source. 
The higher power generation combined with the AES arrays is a big improvement over the legacy pods. We are told that the NGJ can suppress more threats more powerful at longer distances. And this form of electronic attack is seen as a force multiplier, for example, hiding long-range weapons in the jamming till it is too late to react. Since these pods have been designed in the digital age and with an open architecture, they are relatively easy to integrate and make full use of specific growler features. For example, one of the growler components is the technique generation that is a software module capable of analyzing the threat and identify the better frequencies and waveforms to jump the emitter. What exactly it could do is one of those closely guarded secrets, but a fully digitally driven AISA emitter can receive much more complex and sophisticated techniques than a legacy pod with conventional exciters and emitters. Another little known feature is the capability of networking the growlers together. For example, a group of three or more growlers can achieve an extremely accurate geolocation of threats, good enough to guide precision weapons on the targets in a totally passive way. With the AN ARQ249, two or more growlers can merge their situational awareness and coordinate their action via data link, with the operators just prioritizing the targets and the system doing, well, everything else. It is not clear if the system could accept data from another node on the grid, for example an F-35 or an AWOX, in the same way, but I tend to think that if they can do it now, they will be capable of doing it in the near future. So, as you can see, the AN ALQ249 is an important non-kinetic effector. Congratulations for lasting this long not using that word, sir. Well, Otis, I think we should replace uh, effector with weapon and kinetic with real, but well, that's just me. Anyway, we're not over yet because you may ask, why dedicate an entire video to an electronic warfare pod? Well, because this project is not important only for the Navy, it is important for the Air Force too. And why the NGJ is important for the Air Force too? Well, the Air Force hasn't operated dedicated electronic attack since the decommissioning of the EF-111. And the reason is pretty straightforward. Stealth was going to replace it. In the meanwhile, a few squadrons of F-16CM equipped with the HARM anti-radiation missiles and specific targeting equipment would fill the gap. It turned out that while the combination of F-16s and HARM can be very capable, stealth is not the end-all be-all. In fact, the US has in service two electronic attack platforms, the EC-130H based on the Mortal C-130 and uh, its planned replacement, the EA-37B, based on the Gulfstream G550, whose deliveries have started in August 2024. They're both called Compass Call, not because they are the same, the 37B is definitely more advanced, but I imagine out of tradition? Anyway, these aircraft, albeit very capable, do not have the capability of surviving even in a moderately contested airspace, and this doesn't fit with the Air Force doctrine. The Air Force planners fully expect to be capable of penetrating into the opponent's air defenses with a mix of stealthy and conventional platform to hit high paint targets deep into the opponent's territory. These aircraft are not as fast as fighters, they are much more vulnerable and they can't go deep without risking way too much. This is the reason why Raytheon is pushing the NGJ for the Air Force, and the Air Force is indeed interested. Nothing in principle forbids integrating the NGJ on a platform like the F-15E, for example, and execute the same mission as the Growler. Or even better, integrate it on tankers and suddenly have a very effective electronic attack and protection capability on very vulnerable assets. The pods are not autonomous, in both cases you will need some processing capabilities to use them at their best, but it's definitely doable. Anyway, it's early days, we will see how it pans out. Thank you very much for watching, thank you very much for having given me your attention, I hope it was interesting. 
A big thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by any other means. There is also a GoFundMe available, which is connected to a book that I'm trying to write. It's a long-term project. If you're interested, there will be the link in the description below and a QR code on screen. If you can support the channel financially, which is absolutely fine, it's absolutely not needed, please just subscribe if you haven't. Half of the people who watch my videos are actually not subscribed or just leave a comment, hit like, hit the bell. It really helps with the algorithm. So this is everything. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.